to do that you know just come in the garage and you know just pretend it's summer again but yeah the winter weather is uh is well upon us so this poor thing is put up for the winter batteries disconnected uh stabilizer in the fuel tank fresh oil in the crankcase yeah the life of a convertible is a very easy one for the most part in New England because we can really only enjoy them for maybe three out of three or four months out of the out of the year which is why it's not too uncommon to snap up a, a Miata that has you know less than 50,000 miles on it this one had 54,000 on it when I bought it about two summers ago <laughs> and um, and now it's got 63, 63, 841. So still relatively low for a 94. The first car that I ever drove was a 1993 or four uh, Miata base model. It was red and it was brand new. Now you're probably wondering, I'm 35 and in 1993, I was nine years old. In 94, I was 10. So, somewhere in that range. So, how did I get my hands behind the wheel of a brand new shiny red Miata? Well, in my in my local area, there there actually still is an arcade called Fun World in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. Fun World, um, ha they were one of the only East Coast he actually, there might have been two two locations in the east coast of the U.S. that had these. It was a Namco Ridge Runner, and it was the Ridge Runner full scale. It was a driving simulator that utilized a very hot product at the time, the brand new first generation Miata, as a controller. And you would sit in the car. It was heavily modified. There was no drive, tra no engine, no transmission, and it just had a computer up front under th where the engine should be, and sensors connecting to the pedals and the steering rack. Somehow they hooked up a, a steering position sensor, and you would you would drive the car. And uh, it had a um, like a multiple projector system that projected all around you so you could see I, I don't recall how far off to either side it went but it was it was like a cyclorama and um, it cost I think it was seven in 1994 to drive this thing it might have been 95 actually um, but there were seven of these machines in the world and we were of all places we were one of the few in the US to have one of these and uh, so that was the first car that I ever drove. Um, and ever since then, I knew that someday I would own one of these cars. And, well, I finally do. And, boy, howdy, this car is so fun to drive. Um, my Miata is completely stock. Um, I want to keep it that way. Um, but it is an enjoyable car. But... It is one of many cars that I've owned. Uh, again, I'm 35. I've had, so far, I have a list here of 16 cars that I have registered and driven. Um, and this video series is going to go through every one of these cars, why I, how I acquired it, why, what my thought process was at the time, what I liked and didn't like about each particular vehicle, and what went wrong with these vehicles. I'm not going to run down the list of cars right now, but we're going to open up with number one. Number one was a 1987 Volkswagen GTI. Now, I'm going to start off with this. I am not a, a racer, performance enthusiast. I'm none of those things. I, I buy different vehicles for various reasons, be it a life event, 
be it a, uh, a particular need, um, be it a, I just want a particular vehicle for whatever reason that I find to be, you know, valid enough to consider buying it. Um, for example, well, we'll get into that later. So let's start off with number one. My very first car, everybody should remember their first car. Um, mo for most teenagers in the U.S., getting your first car is a rite of passage. It's, it's, a, it's a way of showing the world that you're an adult now, and you can make your own decisions, and you can, you can get around when you need to get around. You don't have to depend on anybody else. It's a mark of independence. And for me, just like any other teenager of my age group, of course, um, it was all of those things. It was my independence. It was my, my first foray into adulthood. Um, and a lot of American teenagers, I would say most of them, um, they get their license at the age of 16. Now, for me, it was a matter of I had to, because my parents would not pay for my driver's ed and they would not buy me a car and that was something that I was okay with. Um, a lot of my friends, they had cars given to them. Their parents paid for their insurance, they paid for their driver's ed. My parents took a different approach. They, they looked at it as, well, okay, you want to be an adult? Act like it. Pay for it. And that's exactly what I did. But I couldn't afford to take driver's ed until I was 17. And, um, no, wait. I think I was 16, actually. I was, I was very late in the 16 year, uh, in my, my 16 year of life. Um, but I, I took driver's ed when I was 16 and a half or so, or, or something like that. And it cost me about what was a lot of money back then. This was in 2001, I believe. 2000. I think it was in 2000. And um, it was a lot of money uh, for, for a teenager. It was about, I think I paid $340, to think of it. And I was in a school district that did not provide drivers. And some school districts actually provided, um, but mine did not. So... I went through driver's ed, and the cars that we drove in driver's ed were 1998 Mazda 626s. Um, and these are, for those of you who don't know, a 626 is a, just a four-door sedan. Um, these were based on the Ford Mondeo platform. Um, you know, they had Ford transmissions, Mazda engines, and, you know, they were... Uh, they were okay cars, you know. They were they were new. Um, this particular company bought new cars every two or three years, so they were up to date, and modern, and um, so that's what I learned to drive officially on. Um, at the time, my parents had a Ford Econoline E350 cargo van. That was my dad's car. He owned it. Uh, he ran a business out of it. And my mom had a '96 Mercury Villager. Um, GS. It was very, very nice. Of, of all the minivans, the Mercury Villager was my favorite because it was, it was like the hot minivan. It was quick, lightweight, um, almost like the Mazda MPV. It was different, you know. It was a lightweight, quick minivan. It had, a, it had the, um, the Nissan VQ30 the uh, basically the Maxima engine. Ford and Mercury, actually Mercury was the, the name they were sold under, but Ford had a deal with Nissan. <clears throat> it was like a joint venture deal. And um, so I guess Ford built the chassis, Nissan built the drivetrain, and it was the Nissan Quest, Mercury Villager, that's, that's what they were yeah, sold as. But anywho, um, it came to a point where <clears throat> I had passed driver's ed and I needed a car and I didn't make a lot of money. Um, I was doing IT work for a local school district as a part-time kind of thing after school or, you know, so I wasn't making much money and, um, and I, 
had a job in a retail store, uh, a computer store. It was a like a like a computer repair shop type deal. And um, my uncle uh, had a friend who was storing a car at my grandparents' house, and um, he offered to try to wheel and deal with this friend and see if I could get the car, you know, for a cheap cheap amount of money, like 500 bucks or so. It was a 1987 Volkswagen GTI. It was a Canadian model, which was interesting. Um, and the, the friend just said, look, you just get it out of the yard and you can have it. So I actually did have a car given to me. But one of the things I didn't really understand at the time was that the most expensive car you could buy was interestingly enough the cheapest one you could get and the cheaper they are the more expensive they are <laughs> to own and maintain so I was all excited when this um, it was a, a dark like a charcoal gray uh, two-door Volkswagen GTI hatchback showed up at my parents uh, driveway on a flatbed I had to pay for the flatbed that was my deal. I had to pay to get the car there. I was all excited. I'm like, I have a car, I have a car, I have a car. But I knew, I knew this wasn't going to be easy. I knew that this free car was going to cost me. And I didn't really know how much until I started digging into it. My father was an auto mechanic at one point in his life. He was a Nissan mechanic. And uh, he worked for a few other places over the years. But he was trained in Nissan but in the 1980s. <laughs> so by 2002, his ASE certifications were nil. But um, it was, uh, actually, I got the car in the spring of 2001, I believe. That's when I got the car. But my uncle, um, he, he, he got it off the flatbed, and he, um, we, we pushed it into the driveway. And uh, we finally hooked up a battery to it. And, Believe it or not, she started. Um, it took a few tries, but the car started. And um, the first thing I noticed, and my, my dad was, was really concerned because the top end of the motor was wrapping like crazy. Um, none of us really knew Volkswagens. All, of course, I did. But my dad and my uncle were not Volkswagen guys. Actually, they were both Nissan mechanics at one point in their lives. Volkswagens were... They're just peculiar cars. They're, they're different. Um, the 1980s water-cooled Volkswagens were just, uh, they were a thing of, uh, they, were, they, were, they were in and of themselves. They were, they were very, very unique uh, compared to the Asian and American vehicles at, at the time. Um, for example, they used uh, Bosch uh, K-Jetronic CIS injection, with continuous injection, which was just, Oh my lord! If you watch uh, Hoobie's Garage, um, you'll you'll see watch this segment on sorting out the fuel system in the DeLorean. Now the DeLorean was another vehicle that used the K Jetronic fuel injection system, and they had so many problems with that system. Um, they were a nightmare when they were new. But that aside, they also had a tendency to make lifter noise. That's the uh, the top end of the motor in the valve train. The lifters were hydraulic and self-adjusting hydraulic lifters and they were notorious for draining back and just making a racket. So we got the thing started. We noticed right off the bat it had a lot of lifter noise. Um, we found that one of the high pressure fuel lines at the top of the motor going into the injector was spraying a very fine mist of fuel. Um, it had seized brake calipers and that both of them were seized. The headliner was falling in, in the interior. The radio didn't work. Um, it was like, if you're going to learn how to fix cars or just learn basic mechanics, a 14-year-old Volkswagen back then was probably not the place to start. That's like learning to swim by having your legs tied up and being thrown into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, <laughs> to, put it, to put it lightly. Um, 
But the car was free, and I and I wasn't going to turn it down. I just said, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to do this. I'm going to fix this car. I've never turned a wrench in my life. I fixed lawnmowers and bicycles, but I've never worked on a car before. But I'm going to get the books, and I'm going to get a job. And I'm going to buy all the parts I need, and I'm going to make this thing run. Well. It took me damn near two years, all of 2001, all of 2002, but I succeeded. I got the car, I fixed every, I did it myself, everything I did myself. Um, I was so proud of myself because I, I my, my dad, you know, I, I'd ask him questions. He knew almost everything I needed to know. He, he knew what to do. But he also wanted me to do it myself. So he, he didn't go in there and start fixing stuff while I was out playing video games. No, no, no. I was, I was, I was in the trenches. Um, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I was reading and learning as I went. Forums were very popular. I went to, I think it was on VW Vortex at one point. The one thing I made, I, the one mistake I made <clears throat> was that I, I, I bought all my parts mail order because I didn't have a way to get around. I had a bicycle. But in the wintertime, bicycling in rural New Hampshire is putting your life in your own hands. So I would save up a few hundred bucks and I would go on RockyMountainMotorsports.com and I didn't have a credit card. I didn't even have a credit card then. I, had, I didn't even have a checkbook. What I would do is I would save up a couple hundred bucks and I'd build up a shopping list of all the parts I needed for a particular product. So if I was doing front brakes, I would buy all the front brake, put a whole big order together. I'd call them, I'd call the company, and I would get a price and an order number. And then I would mail a check to Rocky Mountain Motorsports, and then in like eight weeks, I'd get my parts. It was great. <laughs> we had the internet, but my parents weren't about to put their credit card online, and um, I sure as hell wasn't going to do that either. So I, that's, how we, that's how I got all my parts. And they were expensive. Oh my God. Rocky Mountain Motorsports was one of the most expensive ways to get parts for a Volkswagen. Um, but they were all factory parts. They were, they were factory parts. Most of them came directly from Germany. For example, I ordered um, a complete engine gasket kit for this car. And it was all L-ring straight from Germany. Um, so a couple of things I did to this car myself. I tore the whole motor down to the block. Um, I didn't I didn't do the lower end, but I took I took the motor down to the block, head head off, cooling system out of the car, fuel system out of the car. Um, I replaced every gasket on the outside of that engine. I replaced because they were all leaking. Everything was leaking. The car had a it had two hundred and forty thousand kilometers on it. I mentioned it was Canadian. So the speedometer only read in kilometers. Same with the odometer. So it had 240,000 kilometers on it. That works out to about 130 some thousand miles, I think. And um, but everything was leaking. So what happened? So the cylinder head. Say the reason I do I dug into this car so deeply is because it had an exhaust leak and the cylinder head. Um, I wanted to replace the lift, the lifters. I didn't realize that these lifters were noisy, whether they were new or old. So I just said, you know what? I'm gonna. I, so I sent the cylinder head to a guy in, um, in was it Virginia? I think it was in Virginia. Um, he was a Volkswagen enthusiast. He worked for a Volkswagen shop, and he he rebuilt my cylinder head for me. He put all new, all used but good lifters. Um, all new exhaust and intake studs. He cleaned it, Magnaflux, did a whole thing. Charged me like 400 bucks. I bartered with him. I sent him some other stuff I had, and, and we worked it out. Um, so I, uh, I had the cylinder head redone. I replaced the entire cooling system. Radiator was leaking, so I put in a new radiator. I did all new hoses and all the while you're in there things, like a timing belt. I did an oil pump. I did... Um, the water temperature sending unit. I replaced um, all the injector seals. 
I ended up having to put in a new exhaust manifold, so I bought a used one from a junkyard. Um, that's another thing, is there really weren't a lot of golfs in my local junkyards. Um, and the ones that we had, they were the Digifont ones, so they had, a, they had different field systems and, or, you know, parts that were specific to the GTI I couldn't get. Um, but, yeah, I went through that engine, and um, I'll never forget the first time I started it. It, took, it was like maybe a year after I got the car. And I stuck the key in. I didn't have the exhaust manifold on yet, but I started it up. It ran for like 10 seconds and I shut it off. Uh, but I knew it would run. I was, I was like, yes, it runs, it runs. It was building up oil pressure. Things were good. Um, man. I ended up putting a whole exhaust cat back exhaust on that thing. Um, I did the rear brakes, the front brakes, calipers, hoses, um, and all four discs. It was a, we had a rear disc brake system on it. Um, the GTI was like a Golf, but little, little, little racier. Now, another thing about my Golf, so it was a Canadian model. So it had, um, on the American ones, they, that was the year, the 1987 is when they started the passive restraint system where you close the door and the seatbelt would come around automatically. The Canadian models didn't have that. So the American models, they actually had a padded um, knee pad under the dash, but the Canadian models still had the parcel shelf, which was cool because you could store things there. Um, the American ones had that in 86 and 85, but not, from what I understand, 87, they went to the because of the passive restraint system, they had to put padding under the dash. But the Canadian didn't have that. Um, the Canadian models also, they were supposed to have daytime running lights, I think. But mine didn't have that for some reason. Um, now mine was a, it was a strippy model GTI. So it had, um, it had no air conditioning. It had no power steering. It had, um... It actually had a factory AMF and cassette deck in it at one point. But it had a moonroof. I think all GTIs had the moonroof, regardless of trim level. Um, but that car, I think I only got a few months out of use. I mean, after all the work I put into it, I put in a brand new headliner. My uncle actually did it for me. He was in the auto upholstery business. So he replaced the headliner for me. I took it out of the car. And he brought it to his shop, and he completely relined it, which was it was a it was a nice job. It was like the car was really coming not coming together nicely. I had the interior completely out of it. I was chasing water leaks. Any of you guys, gals who have owned uh, second generation Jettas and Gulfs, you know what I'm talking about. They were notorious for water leaks. Um, every time I got into one, it would always smell like mold and mustiness. Mine was no exception. The windshield was cracked and leaking, so I had to have a windshield put in. Um, it had, what else did it have? Yeah, it had leaks. The sunroof was leaking, or the moonroof. Um, the taillights were leaking. The, um, I mean, this thing had leaks everywhere. And I, so I'm like, you know what? I'm taking the interior completely out. And that's what I found out. The floor was starting to work from all the water leaks. Man, this car couldn't catch a break. <coughs> so, I went through this car tip to tail and I fixed every water leak, I fixed every oil leak, every fuel leak. So after I got the thing started, I was sitting in the car, the engine was running smoothly-ish, as smooth as a 87 Volkswagen with K-Jetronic would ever run, and I started to smell fuel. Now, I'd already fixed a fuel leak in the injection system by replacing all the fuel injector seals. But what happened was, I was looking, I, I, I was walking around the car, and I could see a puddle of fuel building up around the rear passenger rear tire. What had happened was, the steel high-pressure fuel lines were starting to corrode badly and they were spraying fuel everywhere at a very high pressure in my head. 
<laughs> so I'm like, great, great. This is this is great. So what? So one of the one of the things uh, that the Cajetronic system had was they had the high pressure fuel pump just below the fuel tank. It was right in front of the passenger rear tire, and it was mounted to a box that was a reservoir. It had a fuel accumulator on one side, which is a basically it builds up pressure and it maintains that pressure even when the engine's off. So that way it starts up quicker. So there's a pump, oh, and the other side was a fuel filter, a big canister filter. So I took the box down and I found that the whole, the whole shebang, all the lines were rotted. Now remember, this car is from Canada and it spent most of its life in northern New Hampshire. So it, it was from Manitoba, St. James Volkswagen, Manitoba, Canada. They're still in business. That's where it was originally from. But so... I'm like, great, so I've got to replace all these fuel lines. So I did some research and I found that each line, there were like four or five of them or something like that, they were like 80, 150 bucks a piece. And I'm like, I can't afford that. So I phoned my friend over in, uh, in Virginia and I said, hey, you live in an area where cars don't rust. Hook me up. <laughs> and he said, sure thing. So he found me a complete fuel pump accumulator, the whole nine yards. He found me all the parts I needed, charged me very little for them. And um, so that's what I did. I installed all of those parts in to replace what I had that was all rotted away. I had to take the fuel tank out at one point because it was full of sludge. This thing had fuel in it that was five years old. By the time I got it on the road, the fuel was five years old. So I had to drain it all out and put in fresh gas. But uh, I had so much fun working on this car. Did brakes, exhaust, engine work, cooling system. I mean, I to the interior over. Um, and then after I got it on the road, I got a flat tire. Oh, yes. Ah, I got a flat tire. Not a big deal. I grabbed the jack out from behind the, or from the, from the trunk area, and I jacked the car up, and I jacked it from the pinch weld. Because that's what you do when you use the factory supplied jack, you use the pinch well. It, no, no brainer, right? So I jacked the car up. Now this car, mind you, it, it looked really nice underneath. It, this was this car didn't have big holes, it didn't have anything, you know, it looked beautiful underneath because it had a nice thick rubberized undercoating from the factory. It was for soundproofing and rust proofing. But what I didn't realize is that sometimes cars can rust from the inside out, especially when they have water leaks. Oh boy. So I'm jacking the car up and then it crashed. The jack went right through the pinch weld. It just bang right up in there. So I'm like, okay, this is wonderful. This is, this is just great. I'm three, four thousand dollars into this car that I got for free and what looked like a pristine underbody turned out to be made from saltines. Thanks to NACL <clears throat> sodium. Anyway, <laughs> uh, well, long story short, I got the car jacked up and I put a new tire on it. I drove home that night. This was in the winter, this was in December 2002, I come home from work, and I said, Mom, Dad, I'm fucked. <laughs> and they're like, whatever do you mean, son? Like, well, you know that car that I've been putting together in your driveway and I spend my life savings on? Well, it's got holes in the floor, and I need a car. And I have a job now. I had steady income, you know. I, uh... I had to, I, I had to, uh, I had to do something. So, what ended up happening was, um, now the car had other issues, it wasn't just that. It was, um, it, had, it started popping injectors. So I'd be driving along, and then it would start running on three cylinders, and then I'd have to go under the hood and bang the injector back into its socket, because the injectors on the CIS 
cage atronic system were just held in by rubber donuts. And I put new donuts in, and brand new donuts, put them in, and they'd pop out again. The timing wasn't off. I don't know what on God's green earth was wrong with this car, but it just kept, it wasn't backfiring or anything, but almost like it was, but it wasn't. They just kept popping out. And I think the problem was that the replacement rubber seals were of an inferior material, and I didn't want to go out and find new ones again because screw that. Anyway, long story short, they said, here's what we're going to do for you. <clears throat> and I wasn't expecting much. But my parents said, look, you have no credit, you're 18, you need to establish credit. Dave Ramsey wasn't a thing back then, just yeah, FYI. You need to establish credit. We will co-sign on a car loan for you. Now, I was, um, I was already planning my post-high school um, plans. Uh, my plan was to go into the Air Force and then make a career in the Air Force, and that was my plan. So I, I had, I was already signed up. I had, a, I had an, an enlistment date. I just wanted a car that I could buy, not have to worry so much about, and take it wherever the Air Force brought me. And that was my plan. That's what I wanted to do. So my parents said, okay, we'll co-sign on a car loan. And we'll, we'll go over to, um, we went to Tallarico Used Cars. And for those of you from the southern New Hampshire area, you might remember that name. Uh, they have been sold once or twice to a couple of different companies. Tallarico owned a, uh, a Mazda dealer, a Volkswagen dealer, and I believe all GM dealers, all different product lines. So they were, they were a big, big dealership. So I figured, you know, buy from a reputable source. So I went to Tallarico Used Cars. And um, prior to that, actually, we were looking at brand new Mitsubishis. Now, this was at the time when Mitsubishi was offering their no payments for a year plan. You could buy a brand new Mitsubishi and no payments for a year. Um, and uh, I'm glad I didn't do that. <laughs> that would have that would have that would have been a mistake. Not just because I was driving a Mitsubishi, but because they're not, they weren't bad cars then, but it was just a finan it was financial suicide if you did that. So anyway, we looked at Mitsubishi's first, and the cheapest car I could get from them was like fifteen thousand dollars, and it was a strippy gal. Uh, it wasn't even a galan. It was a it was a strippy Lancer, and I'm like I'm not, I don't want to take out that kind of debt right now. Anyway, so we looked at um, some used cars, and, and I wanted something Japanese. And I did no research. I could have, but I didn't. So um, we looked at a uh, we looked at a couple of cars, and I found a '97 Mazda 626 LX. Now, I had driven a Mazda 626 uh, when I was in driver's ed. So I, I knew pretty much what to expect out of the car. And, you know, I knew that, I mean, those cars get abused. So, you know, why not? Why not? Why not a car that can take some abuse? So I, um, we, we sat down at the table. We, we negotiated a price. Um, I looked at the car. Now, it was at night. It was at night. So, you know, I didn't really look the car over too well. But it was um, one of those situations where I just needed something and I, and I wanted to get this over with. So I pulled the dipstick uh, on the transmission, the oil, and they both needed changing. The transmission fluid was, was dark. The oil was dark. The car had 54,000 miles on it. But I'm like, how bad could it possibly be? Um, and that's where we get into our second car on our list. So we're off to cross off number one. I got a pen in here. Oh, I do. Look at that. Cross off number one. And we're now on car number two. 97 Mazda 626 LX. Now, we're going to talk about that car in our next video. So stay tuned.